The text for our sermon is from Hosea chapter 2. Specifically, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. All right, AJ and Brenna, you made it. The day you planned and worked for is here. You're entering into covenant with one another, and in a few minutes you'll make some great promises to each other. Of course, with any covenant, you are contractually obligated to keep those promises. You will agree not to any escape or exit, except by natural death. And your parents, the wedding party, family and friends, indeed myself, we're all witnesses, of course, because I'm the officiant, I'm also the witness of the state to make sure you keep your promise. So as with witnesses, we are obligated to hold you accountable to the agreement and that you'd be faithful to your promises. Of course, that's pretty heavy stuff, isn't it? Yeah. But as we know too well, we're actually not that good at keeping even the most basic and simple promises, never mind the great promises that you make in marriage. We can look around to our world, maybe to our own families, even to our churches, and see that they are riddled with oath-breaking and unfaithfulness, transgressions, and all sorts of violations of even the social contract. I'd like to tell you that's not going to happen to you. No ill will befall you. But unless I'm mistaken, neither of you are perfect. Okay or holy, or just, or entirely good of yourself. So you're each bringing your own baggage to the marriage. Now, there's some encouragement there, because that, now that you'll be joined together, you can help carry each other's flaws. But that won't make it any easier. Sometimes it might seem like it's impossible, and you'll want to throw in the towel and give up. From the perspective of God's Word, it's actually a miracle that this world or in the church, or in our families, that they haven't all just fallen into complete disorder and beyond repair. It's only by, according to the scriptures, God's, God the Father's divine mercy and long-suffering that his creation, including marriage, isn't entirely wiped out under his righteous judgment. His anger is just at our rebellion against the good order of this creation, including the mess we've made of our world and our churches and even marriage and family. But the scriptures also say that his anger is only for a moment, and his steadfast loving kindness lasts into eternity. So, part of the good news for today is that God is at work, even now, for you, restoring, repairing, and even resurrecting our corrupt and fallen world, our churches, and even marriage. If you alone were responsible for the success or failure of marriage, your marriage, you might be able to make it to 10 or 25 or 47 years. There we go. As you grow old together, you might be able to figure out, I hope, how to keep that hostility between two sinners just to a low simmer. And God willing, you'll even have some beautiful moments of intense love and passion that punctuate through. But A.J. and Brenna, you know that God has even more promises for you than just figuring out a way to get along or even just to live together. Even working together to establish a household and a home. God sets before you today, and that's why you're here, the work of Jesus Christ, who is the bridegroom for his bride, the Christian church, whom he loves and has made holy and washed white, like your dress, in his blood shed for her forgiveness. I kind of baited you a little bit when I said you should pick the Hosea text. I think we talked about it. The text we heard a minute ago uh, is God's description of what he does to restore us to faithfulness to him. It's beautiful. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Beautiful. You'll note there that it is the righteousness, the justice, the loving kindness, and the mercy that make the marriage work. And these attributes are actually God's and God's alone. They're not ones that we have. They're the ones that he brings to the marriage. 
And thus only God is faithful to us. And if you read the rest of Hosea, we are the unfaithful one. I chose to spare all of you, including bride and groom, the most severe language about the disaster that we've made of our marital relationship to God. If you want, read it later on. It's in Hosea. Just read the beginning of chapter 2 and, yeah, you'll get the idea. God describes in the most strident terms of marital unfaithfulness, enough not only just to make us blush, but even to hide our shame, ourselves for shame at our adultery, our betrayal of God. I know it's not the most pleasant topic for this afternoon, but it's one that God doesn't want us to forget. Because nestled into that word of God's judgment, there is the promise that despite us, he is faithful to us. God keeps his covenant promise with us to be his people, even despite of us. His faithfulness doesn't depend on our faithfulness to him. It's not a two-way contract where if one side breaks the bargain, then the other can default on it. No, instead, God will move heaven and earth to redeem us from our adulterous sin. He will do what's necessary to satisfy the penalty for our transgression. And of course, as you know, God's faithfulness is yours in Jesus Christ, his son. So Jesus suffers the worst of our betrayal, the whips and the cords, the torturous death, the rejection by his friends, his family, even by his own heavenly father. He does this to forgive you, A.J. and Brenna, from your unfaithfulness to him and to save you from a life that just seems to be a downward slope to death and promises to bless you and keep you today and always in his blood-bought forgiveness. That's the message of the scriptures, that God is preserving what he has made joining together and promising to bless, even when we try to make a mess of it. He preserved the first marriage of Adam and Eve, after all, even after their elder son murdered his younger brother. That story gets repeated over and over. God's people seem hell-bent on separating what God has joined together. But God the Father, Son, and Spirit are constantly at work through the saving gift of his promises received in our baptism and the ongoing nurture of his word to guard, preserve, and uphold your marriage. That's his promise. So yes, you've made it to this day. But it's only the beginning, of course, of what God is doing for you and through you. He's given you to each other. Because it's never good for you to be alone. He will give you to delight in each other's company, as he already has. And he will give you uh, to each other in family each other's family for the encouragement and support of the other. He's also promised to bless you that you be fruitful and multiply. That blessing he made at the beginning still holds true. And these gifts God the Father gives to everyone, to the just and the unjust alike. Of course, you chose to stand here before this altar today because you would have even more from God. You would hear how God is faithful to you even as you have been and will be unfaithful to each other. You'll hear how God in Christ forgives you over and over. And that steadfast loving kindness of Jesus' forgiveness overflows then in forgiveness for one another. I think we talked about that, that it's really the only thing that keeps marriage together is learning to forgive in Jesus' name. Although it's been a few months since we talked, right? All right. That, that's a gift that you can't get when you stand before uh, the magistrate, the judge, justice of the peace. It's a gift that the world cannot give, but it is yours through Jesus' blood, delivered by his promise and received in faith. So my prayer for you is that your marriage find itself dwelling richly in Jesus' forgiveness. You have the gift that can see you through whatever might try to tear you apart from each other or from God, and it's that forgiveness given daily in the church. So how about we start there? This might be a little different than what you expected. A.J. and Brenna, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And may that peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds, and your marriage in Christ Jesus. Amen.